glad everyone's here this evening. Let's everyone stand for the pledges of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior who is the King of the Saints, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, and will hide his words in my heart that I might sin.
found in Mark chapter 10. I'm just reading from one verse tonight, verse 21. It says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. And he said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. There's a lot in that, that one verse. A lot in that one verse. Uh, are the things that you're doing to go to church, pray, uh, preaching, singing, whatever it may be that you're doing, are they leading? Are those things leading people to Christ? You see, that's why God has left us here is to lead people to Christ. If the answer is no, then the question tonight is do you understand what it will take? Do you understand what it will take? I have about four or five points to the message tonight. <clears throat> First thing he tells us is our thankfulness. You see, if we are thankful, then it will show up in what we do. Uh, Jesus said about several people in the Bible that they responded because of their thankfulness. He asked the question, who is more thankful? The one that's had a lot done for them or the one that's just had a little bit done for them? And the guy said, I suppose the one that's had the most done for it. He said, that was answered rightly. That was answered correctly. But sometimes we forget just what God has done for us. And so he tells us tonight that we need to be thankful, first of all, I believe, for our personal decision. You see, I am thankful tonight that Jesus touched my life. Uh, he's used someone to touch our lives, to give us leadership and direction. Uh, I'll never forget Brother Tom Steele taking me under his wing when I was a young man. And uh, invited me to go out and visit. I didn't know anything about visitation. He come and he said, uh, "How about me and you going out on visitation Thursday night or Tuesday night or whenever? I don't remember when it was. It's been so long ago. He's been in glory twenty years or twenty-five." But that old man took me under his wing and he said, "Let's go out and visit." And his wife didn't even come to church. I don't ever remember her coming to our church. She went to another church. But uh, he was just a down-home boy from down around Stanford, Kentucky, if I remember right. And uh, he took me under his wing, and we went out, and we did visitation. And when we were done with visitation, he kind of looked over at me, and he said, Do you like root beer? I said, Yeah. He said, Let's go to root beer stand and get us root beer. <laughs> and that just kind of became a regular thing for me and Tom to go out and visit, make three or four visits, and go to the root beer stand. <laughs> He, he hooked me up with a root beer stand back there. I used to go over there and buy it by the gallon. Uh, they just had good root beer over there. Tom knew it. So uh, he taught me and he made it fun to be able to go out and visit people. But I'm thankful for someone speaking to me and bringing a personal decision to me. I don't, there's several people I think had a hand in being able to share the idea of the Lord with me. My mother, most importantly, probably, because she saw that we went to church. I just he thought that I was a Christian because she took me to church on a pretty, pretty regular basis. But uh, that doesn't make you a Christian just because you go to church. Okay, so he, he tells us that sometimes a lot of people have a hand in it. You know, there were several people. I know my mom did. Uh, you've heard me talk about my grandpa Smith quite often, uh, that he was the same way. I went to church with him a lot when I would go uh, to Kentucky with my mom and dad. Usually... When we got there, Grandpa was going on a Saturday night to church. And uh, he went to an old Free Will Baptist church. They didn't have a piano. They didn't have a guitar. They had a pitch pipe he blew on. And he would hum a few notes and take off and some of the prettiest music you ever heard they would sing. But he was a song leader besides being a deacon in a church. But I'll never forget his faithfulness of getting up and going to church. Many times we got there and he would say... I know you just got here, and I'm not trying to run y'all, but how long are you going to get to stay? I was just on my way to church, and you're all welcome to go. I'll be back in a little bit. And I would usually go with Grandpa. Sometimes my dad would take us. Sometimes me and him would just walk. It was about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile to, to church through the woods, cutting the kind of cat corner behind the house. But we used to do that a lot. And I'll never forget him putting that old felt hat on his head and taking off. Didn't matter what the weather was, he went as long as he was able. And that made a great impression upon my life. Many people make a great impression upon their lives by 
what they say or what they do to lead us, and that helps us to make our personal decision. I'll never forget Brother Bowen as he preached the Word here <laughs> at this church over the brick building, uh, preaching the Word. As I said, I thought I was a Christian, but what he preached, and you know his messages, the messages that he shares are plain and simple and to the point. And it takes him about 20 minutes and he's done. But what he says is profound. It is. And uh, as I listened to the message, I understood that I needed to be saved. And uh, I came forward and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior Amen. through Brother Bowen. So there was many people that had a hand in my personal decision. As you think back over your decision, if you've made a decision, then think about your personal decision. Those that had a hand and being able to help you to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because you see, they're all important. Every one of them are important. Because as I've said many times before, that's why God has left us here, is to be an influence on those that we come in contact with. Maybe as a grandparent. This morning, Miss Georgia went and saw one of her grandchildren be baptized. Uh, that's an important time in life. I, would, I told her, I said, I wouldn't miss that for anything. I think that's important. You heard me say last week, I had a great hand in leading my Uncle Noble to the Lord. I uh, witnessed to him many times about the Lord. And when he got saved, I made a trip five hours from here to Tennessee to be able to watch him be baptized because of his decision. I had a hand in that. And so he tells us it's important to look and remember and realize, if you will, that someone told us about Jesus. Someone helped us come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. So be thankful for that. Also, we need to be thankful today for the promise that we have of an eternal home. You see, we have a promise of an eternal home from Jesus Christ. He said, for if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Amen. I use that at almost every funeral I do, but especially for Christian funerals. Because that's key for us. That's important for us to be able to realize that Jesus has gone to prepare a home for us. Amen. And when he comes back and gets us, it's an appointment. It's an appointment that he said. He said, I go to prepare a place and I will be back to get you. Amen. And I, I tell people all the time at Christian funerals, you know, they say, well, an angel came and got you. Well, I don't think an angel comes and gets Christian people. I do believe our God is big enough and strong enough that he can come and get each and every one that belongs to him. And I believe he does. Amen. That's just my opinion. Amen. But he tells us here that we have that promise for the eternal home in heaven. So that's important. Be thankful today that when Jesus left this earth, he told his disciples and he told us, I will not leave you comfortless. That's important for me. That's important for me today that he left a comforter. That he left someone that he said he would leave the presence of himself in the Holy Spirit that will be able to lead me and to guide me. I tell people all the time, you know, you may not know right from wrong, but I promise you, if you're truly saved, God will lead you in a direction. You'll have a guilty feeling over things that you do that are wrong. You'll have a leadership direction in the things that you need to do to serve the Spirit of God. Now, it's a choice whether or not you choose to do those things, but I believe God's Holy Spirit is left behind. He said, I will leave my presence with you to lead you and to comfort you and to give you leadership and guidance. So it's important to see that. He says it's a, a promise of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Also, I think we need to be presently thankful for the joy that we have in our life. We're, we're just not thankful most of the time for the joy we have in our life. I see so many people as Christians that walk around, as you've heard me say before, looking like uh, Brother Wilkerson said, like they've been, an old mule been sucking buttermilk out of a churn. <laughs> they, just, they got a big frown on their face. They're all puckered up. They don't. If you got Jesus in your heart, you need to put a smile on your face. Right. Let the world know that because they're looking for hope. They're looking for gratification. They're looking to see some joy in this world. And so it's important, he tells us today, to realize that we should be thankful for our present grace, the present joy that we have. So he tells us we need to be importantly thankful for our thankfulness today. Second of all, if we're going to realize what it will take, we must realize the tragedy that we face in this world today. You see, the tragedy we face today is the silence of our lips. That's the problem. You see, we're afraid to say anything. We're afraid to say anything to the world. We're afraid to say anything to our families. We're afraid to say anything to our children or our grandchildren because we don't stir anybody up. What do you talk to the lost world about? What do you talk to them about? The weather? Do you talk to them about your family? Do you talk to them about world events? 
Or do you talk to them about Jesus? See, Jesus gave us the leadership and the direction. He left the comforter to be able to tell us, give us the leadership to be able to talk to them about him. That's the only reason he left us behind. He didn't leave me here to talk about the weather. Now, I learned to be able to go into someone's home and talk about the weather. One of the key things I learned to do was to go into their home and look around. If there's a moose head hanging on the wall, he probably likes to hunt. I do too. So I can talk to him about hunting. That'll, that'll get in his shirt pocket if I talk to him about hunting, okay? Also, if I see a bunch of pictures of grandchildren around, you know, most of these grandmas, if you say, How's your grandchildren? They'll say, I'm glad you asked. And they'll pull this big accordion thing out that's got 50 pictures in it. Because they want to talk about their grandchildren. So it gives you an open door to be able to do that. But that's not the reason we go to talk to people. That's not the reason that God gives us leadership. He gives us leadership to be able to talk to people about sharing Jesus Christ with the world. So it's important. So he tells us we fail in the silence of our lips because we do not say the things we're supposed to do. We fail in our separated lives. We fail in our separated lives. And that's a fine line. I know it's hard for us. You hear me preach all the time. You can't find yourself connected to someone by going hanging out in a bar. I know there's a lot of lost people there, but I can't go hang out in a bar. Now, I might catch them coming out of the bar and witness to them or whatever, but I don't even like to be standing around those places because it just throws an influence, okay? But I can run into them out in the world. I can watch and catch them, and I can definitely pray for them, okay? So he tells us that sometimes the problem is that the tragedy that we have is that we lead too much of a separated life. Uh, we need to be connected somewhat to them. So we don't need to avoid contact. We need to have some contact with them. Like I said, that's fine line right there. He also tells us we fail many times in our selfish <coughs> longings. You see, that's the problem of the world today. Brother Jim gave me a book today. I started reading that, by the way. Just read the fly leaf or what have you. Today, the main problem of the world is self-gratification. You see, we're more concerned about me and what I can get and what I can attain than we are about helping people. You know, back it used to be when my mom and dad were growing up, someone's barn burned, the whole community got together and helped them put it back up. Someone's crops failed or they needed uh, their tractor tore up or whatever. Other people in the area would come over and help them get their crops in. Uh, I remember watching, maybe many of you watched it with me, uh, it was something about the harvest, but uh, our mission board was using it. And a guy was farming a big farm, had a big farm, hundreds of acres, and the crops were ready to take in. He had a heart attack and he died. And so his family was at a loss. And I'll never forget looking up and seeing eight to ten combines come down the road. <laughs> Farmers. As they got together and they helped him take in his crops. Because he was gone, his family needed that income. And that's what God's telling us here. He says that many times we have these selfish longings for self-gratification and we don't care about other people. That's what's wrong with the world today. We need to care about one another. You see, we have today we have so many political people and, and political offices and stuff. They don't care about you. They don't care about me. All they care about is getting what they can get. They care about right. getting the next dollar. They care about getting a retirement. They care about putting in a swimming pool out back. They could care less about me and you. And that's where we're leading today. We need to be careful. We need to pray for godly leaders in our family. We need to pray for the king of the universe to give us leaders that will lead us in a godly manner today. Because I think it's very important. Because our selfish longings for gratification today have spread throughout our nation. I just read the very opening of that book, and that's basically what it said. It said all of our nation's leaders, all of our corporate leaders, that's what happened to GM. I always said that. I worked for them. I, I worked a good full life there. But that's what happened to GM. They didn't want the whole pie. They didn't want a piece of the pie. They wanted the whole pie. And that's what happened. And it spread to other places. I used to, you know, people said, well, I'm glad to see GM getting knocked down. So I mean, people have had it. Like a gravy train all the time. I said, make no mistake about it. It's like throwing a big rock in the middle of my pond. Splash! Mm -hmm. And if you stand out to the edge, sooner or later, it's going to ripple effect out to the edge. And it did. And it's still doing it. But he tells us that many times our selfish longings for what we want, what we desire, 
Instead of Jesus said, we're to share that love from one another. We're to care for one another, to pray for one another, to help one another, to assist one another. We don't see that much today. Salvation of the lost has to become important to us if we're going to see them saved. Also, he says we fell in our secondary loves. He says here, Jesus, Paul, and the disciples, who did they love? They loved Jesus. They loved Jesus. They stood for Jesus. They even, some of them, most of them, gave their lives to live for Jesus. Yep. That's where we need to be today. We need to give our lives for Jesus. We need to be sincere enough about serving the God of the universe, the one that gave us the comforter, the one that provides everything we have, everything we have. We need to be thankful enough that we'll serve him with our lives. That's where we're at today. It's all about me. It's not about him. We need to be careful about that because our hearts have become hardened. Amen. You see, today, there's very few people, older people saved. As a matter of fact, there's very few younger people saved today. We've had several people saved in our church here in the last little while, and I'm getting ready to do a baptism. But I tell them, I've been watching some of them for a while. Because you know what? I'm just not about baptizing people because they came forward and said a little prayer. I want to see proof in their life. I want to see them serving God. I want them to be sincere about serving God. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And so he tells us we need to look at that because our, we have secondary loves, and we need to realize that. Most of us have hard hearts, not heavy hearts. We have hard hearts, not heavy hearts. We need to have heavy hearts tonight. We need to be heavily concerned for the lost world, for our families, especially for our families. Do you realize that we're going to leave all those who are not saved, every one of those who are not saved, we're going to leave them behind? We need to be heavy-hearted for those people. We need to be praying for them. We need to be concerned because I believe the time is short. Not only that, he says, not only is it our tragedy tonight, but I believe it's our cheerfulness that's involved. What will it take? It'll take our cheerfulness. How long has it been since we shed tears for one that we loved? How long has it been since we shed tears? I mean, actually cried and said, God, please save them. Yeah. Speak to their hearts. Please save them. Mm -hmm. You see, we can't save them, but we can pray for them. God tells us that we need to be brokenhearted, first of all, for the coming judgment that's coming. You see, those that are left behind are not just going to die. They're going to spend eternity in hell. That's what he says. He says those who are not saved, those who do not receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are going to be left behind. They're going to die and they're going to go to hell. So we need to be concerned about the coming judgment on the world. Are we really concerned about the coming judgment on the world or are we concerned about self? We must be concerned about the judgment that is coming. Not only that, but we need to be broken hearted for the charges that will come. You see, we all have guilt in our lives. But we need to be concerned about the charges that are coming at that time. Earnestly concerned about the charges. Because if we are, it will make a difference in our life. I believe that. He tells us that those charges will be presented at the judgment seat. That's important. That's important. So we need to be concerned about it. Not only that, but we need to be broken hearted tonight for the consequences. We need to be broken hearted for the consequences that will be realized at the judgment seat. You see, there's some people that the Bible clearly says will stand before him and say, Lord, I did this and I did that in your name. And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, before I, because I never knew you. I never knew you. We need to be concerned. We need to be earnestly asking God to give us leadership and direction that we're not led astray like that. That we're earnest about what we do. That we serve God with a vigor that we realize the consequences that will take place on that day and that we're praying for those around us that will suffer those consequences. You know somebody like that? I do. I hope I'm not one of them. I'm praying I'm not one of them, but I know a lot of people that I believe they think they're okay. They may be attend a church service every now and then. They may, be, may put a few dollars in the offering plate, but they're not sold out to God. They really haven't made a sincere decision. If they had, their lives would be different. I'm not just I'm just fruit judgment, if you will. God says, I can't judge you, but he says, I can look at an apple tree and see if there's apples on it or pineapples. Okay. <laughs> pineapples don't grow on an apple tree. 
So he says, I can look at that tree and see if there's any fruit. That's important for us. So we need to realize the consequences that he says will be realized at the judgment seat. Wouldn't it break your heart to be able to see someone that you knew in church that was coming to church every now and then and maybe was given a few dollars and maybe sent some flowers every now and then or whatever, but they really were not right with God. That would be heartbreaking, one. That would be heartbreaking to be able to see those. Not only that, but he says, we'll be brokenhearted, I believe, for the convictions that will take place. Wouldn't it be convicting and breaking your heart to see convictions of those that you love? Those that you thought maybe were going to go with you and they're going to be left behind? But he tells us that it's time for us to get a burden for the lost and be concerned for them, to be concerned for our communities and to be concerned for our country as a whole. Now, I look at our country. Our country is pathetic. And I, I love our country as good as anybody. I love the flag. I love the, our servicemen. But sometimes I know I've been there. Sometimes you're as a serviceman, you wonder, what am I fighting for? Mm -hmm. When I get off of a plane and people spit in their face, <coughs> that kind of thing, it's disheartening. It's disheartening. You know, I like to see some of these old guys that uh, have been in the military in World War One, World War Two. I've got an old hat on that uh, they served in a, a battleship somewhere or something. I like to go up to them and tell them, thank you for your service. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen. They don't hear that much. They don't hear that much. And it's important that we get a burden for our country, for the lost around us. Not only that, but it's time for us to be broken spiritually. We're not really broken spiritually. He says we need to be broken spiritually for their spiritual condition. We need to realize those people around us that aren't spiritually right. And I hear some people talking to me about their families and those loved ones. and They're spiritually broken. Our hearts are broken for them. It's important for us to be broken for them. We're supposed to be broken for them. I don't mean that we're supposed to go around with a sad look on our face all the time. We need to put a smile on our face, like I said a while ago. But our hearts need to be burdened. How often, me and my wife have been just concentrating here lately on some of our loved ones that we need to pray for. Because some of them claim to be Christians, but I don't really see it in their life. You now, if you're a Christian, you go to church. If you're a Christian, you're going to spend some time with God. Just saying I'm Christian doesn't make you a Christian. You need to be serving God, not concerned for some of those. So God says we need to be broken spiritually for their spiritual condition. And we need to set the example for them so that they will change their lives, so that they'll see something in our lives that they desire, something that they want. He tells us not only that, but it's time for us to be busy. You see, it's time for us to be busy for the agenda of the Father. Not to be busy for my agenda, but to be busy for the agenda of the Father. And if we don't have a concern for the lost, if we don't have a concern for our families, if we don't have a concern for those around us, then we're not really busy for the Father. We can be busy doing all kinds of things. But if we're just busy, that's not doing what God wants us to do. He says we must be busy for His agenda. You're not going to get that from me. You're going to get that from Him. Okay? As you pray to Him, He's going to give you that leadership. He's going to give you that direction. The Spirit's going to give you that direction. You see, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I start out in one direction, I wind up somewhere else. That's because the leadership of God has led me some other place. I'm not saying that I'm all that bag of chips, but I try to follow the leadership of the Lord. And sometimes God changes my direction. Often He changes my direction. My wife will tell you, I thought you were going to Miami Valley Hospital. Well, that is where I started. <laughs> <laughs> but I wind up in a different place. And if you're not open to the Spirit, if you're not listening to the Spirit, you can't respond to the Spirit like that. Become dedicated. Become dedicated to winning the lost and become dedicated to reaching those in your family that are lost before we run out of time because I believe the time's short. Yeah. I do. Right. I hear people all the time telling me that all these big name preachers that they're listening to, all of them, all of them that know what they're talking about are talking about the end of time. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they believe it's near. Because they believe it's close. And so we need to be involved and we need to be dedicated. Last thing he says, we need to realize our treasure, our treasure. You see, God has promised us a vision of gold beneath our street, uh, beneath our feet as we walk down the street of gold. And I've had a lot of people ask me about it. Some people say streets of gold. It doesn't say that. It says street of gold. Now, I don't know if that's going to be a street of gold or not, but I promise you if it's not, it'll be something better. It'll be platinum or something like that. 
<laughs> but I believe that God is fully capable. If he made gold in the world, he's capable of making a gold street. Amen. And so whether that's true or not, I don't care. But one thing I am looking forward to, I'm looking forward to being there. Okay? Amen. I'm looking forward to being there. I'm looking forward to being there with my loved ones. I'm looking forward to being there with all those that serve the Lord together with me. And I'm looking forward to the freedom of the Spirit there that we don't have here on this earth. We really don't. Our goal is what we need to be concentrated on. Paul said, keep your eyes focused on the goal. Keep your eyes focused on the goal. You've heard me say before, I remember my dad telling me when I plowed to keep my eye focused across the field. You know, it's, it's tempting to look around, look down at the dirt, uh, look over at a bird or whatever. If you do, when you look back after you get across that field, that, that row will look like that. But if you stay focused on a fence post or a tree or a rock at the other end of the field, you stay focused. When you get to the end of that field, turn around and look back, you'll say, how'd that plow that straight? Because you kept your eye on the goal. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, our goal of the eternal home is not made by common man. Our goal tonight is to keep focused. Paul said, stay focused on the gift. Stay focused on the goal. Stay focused on where you're going. That's important. You see, our internal presence, our eternal presence is going to be with God. He's the one we will answer to. And our presence will be with Him for all of eternity. What a great blessing He has offered for us. Common man, as Paul said, to be able to stand before God, to be able to serve with Him, to be able to live with Him in heaven. He didn't have to invite us to come home and live with Him, but He did. You know, when someone comes and stays, uh, overnight with us or whatever. We like to have them stay. We like to have them stay overnight. Jesus said, just come on home and stay. I love the end. He said, just come on home and stay. Let's just go to my place and stay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So the goal is to be with God, the God of the universe. Not only that, but the last point is to remember the great reunion. The great reunion. You now we all look forward to that Lord's Supper. We all look forward to that great time and uh, I share often many times that I believe that those who are Christians who've gone on before, they're having a great reunion. They're sharing with many loved ones who've gone before. Right. They're, they're around the throne of God. Uh, we need to rejoice in that fact, you know. It's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to comprehend. Uh, but I believe that the Spirit leaves the instant that we die. The instant we die, that Spirit is with God. And I think it's a great family reunion that they're having. Now, we're going to have a, a great physical reunion around the Lord's Supper table one of these days, but I'm looking forward to that as well. And you should be looking forward to that. You see, he says it's our treasure. It's the treasure, the gift that God has given us that we claim to. That's what God has promised us. In conclusion today, what will it take? What will it take for us to wake up and realize the time is short? What will it take? for us to wake up and realize the time is short. Will we be energized enough to be able to share the story of Jesus with the world? See, you can't tell the world about something that you don't know about. You must know about the story of Jesus. And if you've not received him, you don't know, you don't really know the story. Because you see, he reveals the story to us after we become his children. We may know about it, believe that he was a prophet that lived 2,000 years ago, but you don't really know Jesus until you receive him, until you accept him. So it's important for us to be able to realize that time. What's your decision? You've heard all of the points that I brought up tonight, but what's your response? How did they affect you? Examine them as we look at this tonight. That's all I'm saying. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share the word tonight, Father. Thank you for all of the points, Father, that you shared just out of one verse tonight. Father, help us to be responsive tonight as the Spirit speaks to our heart. And Father, if there's anyone here that needs to make a decision, just needs to rededicate their life, just needs to be faithful, Father, just uh, maybe needs to be saved, that Father, you would speak to that heart. Help them to come to know you in the loving Spirit tonight, Father. Lord, bind their hearts together and help us to trust in you. And Father, we'll be careful to give you the praise and all the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray. Amen. You come and do whatever God's laid on your heart tonight. I can't make it any easier than this. I know there's not a lot of people here tonight. But God is no mistake or a person. He speaks in a positive way. I'm just his vessel. I'm just the pipe he pours a message to. But the message was meant.